Let's take our Bibles at this time and turn to two passages, Isaiah 42 and Matthew chapter 12. Isaiah 42, we'll read the first 16 verses. Verses 1 through 4 is my text, but this is referred to, this prophecy of Isaiah in Matthew 12, verse 14 and following, so we'll read that too and have that in front of us as we consider these marvelous things of the prophecy of the servant of the Lord. Isaiah 42 and 1 through 16 first. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. Smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Thus says the Lord, God the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name. and My glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Sing to the Lord a new song, and his praise from the ends of the earth, you who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you coastlands and you inhabitants of them. Let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voice, the villages that Kedar inhabits, let the inhabitants of Selah sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains, let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. The Lord shall go forth like a mighty man. He shall stir up his zeal like a man of war. He shall cry out, yes, shall shout aloud. He shall prevail against his enemies. I've held my peace a long time. I've been still and restrained myself. Now I will cry like a woman in labor. I will pant and gasp at once. I will lay waste the mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will make the rivers coastlands, and I will dry up the pools. I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will lead them in paths they have not known. I will make darkness light before them, and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. And then, verse 17, they shall be turned back, they shall be greatly ashamed, who trust in carved images, who say to the molded images, you are our gods. Thus far we read the prophecy of Isaiah, and we'll be repeating verses 1 through 4 presently, but turn now to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 14 and following. That is through verse 21. Matthew 12, 14. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him, that is, against Jesus, how they might destroy him. And the occasion with this is that he healed a man on the Sabbath day. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. He healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, and this is our text, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. Thus far we read for our scripture reading Old and New Testament this evening, and we want to draw attention to Isaiah 42 and the first four verses at this time. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. 
I have put my spirit upon him. I will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. The major theme of Isaiah the prophet is that salvation is of the Lord. It is not of any foreign power. Israel, Judah may not trust in any foreign power, whether it's Babylon or Egypt or Syria. Salvation is not of Judah itself. Salvation is of Jehovah God. A closely related theme of Isaiah often missed is introduced, especially in this last part of the book from chapter 40 and onward. And it's this, that the salvation which is of the Lord is through a servant of Jehovah God. In fact, our text is one in which Isaiah is introducing uh, the concept, the reality of the servant of Jehovah God par excellence, who is Messiah. Isaiah 42 is the first of four passages that stand out in Isaiah and in all of the scripture prophecies of the servant of Jehovah. There's another one in Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 9, another servant passage in Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 9, and another one that starts in Isaiah 52, verse 13, and it's through chapter 53, the well-known passage of God's servant who shall deal prudently and be exalted and extolled and be very high, and yet he's despised and rejected of men, the man of sorrows. As is clear, especially from this last passage, which we know very well, Isaiah 53, the servant of Jehovah is Messiah. And in all of these passages, we are called to behold the servant, Messiah. And you look at our text, the very first word in Isaiah 42, 1 is, Behold, look. Children, it's as if your parents are saying, look at this great thing we've just seen. Look at this sight. Or maybe they're pointing out danger, behold and watch out. Maybe it's a good thing. They want you to see it and to be happy about it. Well, certainly when Isaiah the prophet is inspired to write of the servant of the Lord, he has good things to say and he wants to say to all the people, you've got to see this. You've got to see this. And so... Hundreds and hundreds of years before Messiah came, Israel was craning its neck, as it were, in the light of the prophecy to see this kind of Messiah who would come, who's called the servant of the Lord, and who doesn't put out the smoking flax, he doesn't break the bruised reed, and so on. And so Judah had hundreds of years to think about this, but now we do too. The whole of the Church of Christ is called to join the people of Judah long ago with anticipation. But now as Jesus has come, and especially because we know something of him who's come, and we know that it's true what Isaiah said, everything. And then we have the New Testament reflecting upon this wonderful prophecy of the servant of the Lord Jesus. And so with joy, we behold by faith Jesus as we consider this whole truth of the servant of the Lord in several sermons, as we call in an Advent series before we celebrate Christmas as Church of Jesus Christ. So the servant of Jehovah's, our uh, theme for these sermons, and tonight especially we're going to focus on his identity and work and his manner and his might, which is peculiar. He is this meek one, who doesn't cry or lift up his voice, but he's powerful. And then finally, we want to touch upon our beholding and serving. All these themes we're going to be bringing out as we expand the text and and deal with the whole of this revelation here, 
I can hardly wait, beloved, and I hope that you are full of eager anticipation to hear the word of God here. The servant of Jehovah, behold my servant whom I uphold. That's in front of us. That's the object of our looking by faith. The servant of Jehovah, who is he? Well, he's the Messiah. Messiah is the Old Testament word for the Savior. In the Hebrew, it's Mashiach. And so the English is Messiah. And that means the anointed one. As we'll see, that means he has the spirit on him. But Messiah. Now, this is important for us to understand here right at the get-go. Because in the prophecies, there were many servants of Jehovah. But this one here and in the prophecies that follow, the servant of Jehovah passages refer especially to the one servant of Jehovah who's different than they all. Jehovah has many servants. And uh, we can say that they all serve him, all these servants, because they're servants of Jehovah, whether they know it or not, so that God's sovereignty is brought out here. He's the God who has servants. He's the God of hosts of the armies of heaven and the armies on earth. He's the God who's over all. In fact, we know that even heathen unbelievers like Cyrus, who lets the people back, and Nebuchadnezzar, who makes great prophecies of Jehovah, are servants, and they're called servants of Jehovah. Jeremiah 25, verse 9, for example. Israel itself is called a servant of Jehovah. And there's been no little controversy about this, so I want to point this out. Israel is called the servant as a whole nation. Isaiah 41, verses 8 through 10, for example. Behold, you, Israel, are my servant. And the Israel there is this. Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend, you whom I've taken from the ends of the earth and called from its furthest regions and said to you, you are my servant. I've chosen you and have not cast you away. Fear not, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I'm your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. A lot of those things are said of the servant here of Jehovah, though their identity is distinct. So the whole nation is called God's servant, as the whole nation is called God's son, whom he delivers out of Israel or Egypt, but here his servant. Like the Pharisees, they were servants of Jehovah, representatives of the, uh, the Jewish people and servants of God. Then the elect themselves are called in a special way God's chosen people who are made willing in the day of his power chosen to serve him and made truly to do this with gladness and with love. We are called servants of Jehovah, prophets and priests and kings. But this one is Messiah. This one is the Christ. Clear it is from the other string of passages that refer to him doing the same manner of work as in our passage, those servant of Jehovah passages. For example, Isaiah 53, 11 Jesus is called there, clearly Jesus is called there, the righteous servant who will justify many. And there's only one who can do that, and that's the Messiah. And we're reminded of that servantness of Jesus in a passage like Philippians 2, 7, where this servant is one who made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. That's what Christmas is all about, and you didn't learn that from Charlie Brown. Our text speaks of Messiah then centrally. In fact, everything he does here, bringing judgment to the nations, to the ends of the earth, not just to Israel, bespeaks this worldwide Messiah, the Savior of the world. This is Christ's calling here, his work his manner, his success. He will not be thwarted in his calling. Context speaks of the calling of Jehovah, verses 6 and 7. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand or uphold you 
and will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. Clearly, this is Jesus, Jehovah Jesus in the flesh. To assure us without any question and any doubt whatsoever that this passage refers to Jesus, we have the passage that I read in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 15 and following. There is a direct reference to Jesus. When he's healing, and when he's healing those whom the Pharisees don't even want him to heal, he is fulfilling the wonderful prophecy of Isaiah, and especially when he tells them, shh, don't tell anybody about this. That is said to be the fulfillment of one who comes and he doesn't cry in the streets, he doesn't announce himself, he's not boisterous, he doesn't want all the attention just on him, because after all, he's only a servant of Jehovah, he wants others to be pointed to God. More on that presently, but this is clearly Jesus who is mentioned here, and he's called a servant. Now, this may strike us, and this, in fact, is the stumbling block of the gospel. That we have a God, we say, who's just a servant. And there's so many ways that Jesus points out that he's a servant, that he wants, as it were, the stumbling block of Christianity truly to be out there. It'll be a foundation stone for the church that believes in the mysterious revelation of God with us, but it will also be something over which the nations, they fall. They can't, they can't go there. They're not about serving. They're about self-serving. They're not about a God who serves and who's weak and who's meek and who's mild. And we'll have nothing of that as they climb up the corporate ladders and as they celebrate their giving and not the giving of God. But Jesus Christ is the servant of Jehovah. And this he is in his human nature, of course. Of course, as God, he's very God. Great is the mystery of godliness. God manifests in the flesh. But he's also human. And so the one who's co-equal with the Father and the Spirit, nothing less, not subordinate. We don't believe in subordinationism. That was the heresy of old that said the Father was the greatest and the Son was second and the Spirit was third. And that's what we mean by the three persons of the Trinity. No, they're all co-equal, like unto God, each one of them equally. But in his human nature, he is human. And in the human nature, he comes voluntarily to place himself under the Father. Jesus, you see, does things that it is given to him to do as the person of the Trinity who would take on human flesh and who would subordinate himself to the will of Jehovah. And so he does Jehovah's will and only Jehovah God's will. His meat, in fact, his delight is to do the will of the Father who sent him. He must be about his Father's business. These are all quotations of Jesus in the New Testament. As a servant, he will do Jehovah's will slavishly, if we could say this, painstakingly, so that he will never do, never even think to do, anything outside of God's holy will. Now, this is Jesus' freedom. This is the expression of Jesus' love. And it ought to give us pause here when we think of our freedoms and our loves. Jesus subordinates all human loves and freedoms and things that perhaps as a human one might want to do to God's will. He's a servant, not just on Sunday, not just on the cross, Every single day, 24-7, come to do the Father's will. The servant of servants, he, not as the Pope who claims to be the vicar of Christ, and as that, the servant of servants. That's abomination. You cannot serve God and not do his will or add to the Bible. Jesus came in the volume of the book, it was written of him, 
and therefore he came to do everything that God had decreed for him. He had no delight, you see, in doing his own will. Selfishness and perversity never once came to his mind. Not even when he was facing the prospect of the cross, no, the servant of Jehovah. So he's this servant. And, and for this, it was an office. It was a position. Several things our text brings out. Number one, he's chosen. Before you were elect, you had one in whom you were elect. That is, Jesus. We're chosen in Jesus, who's called here my elect one. This is so very important and profound. The Reformed doctrine of election is rooted in the election of Christ, in the eternal appointment of God, the triune God, the Son is appointed, in the decreeing about the worlds and the creation of everything. Christ is the one whom God is concerned to glorify. Jehovah calls him mine elect. He is, in fact, the one who is God's elect eternally. It wasn't that God came up with Christ. Never could be. And this, beloved, is not about supra or infralapsarianism. It's simply what the Bible teaches is God's will. His elect is not just you or me, though that's marvelous, but it's Christ first of all. He's the God, after all, of the covenant, ordaining the Son who would engage in the office of mediator, the Savior of the church. It is unthinkable that God would ever have no counsel of the election of his Son, because God the Father would glorify himself in his Son this way, this way in the marvelous appointment and anointment of the Son, Jesus Christ. This one who's chosen is said to be upheld. It's said first in the text, Behold my servant whom I uphold. But that's based on the fact that he is the elect one, so we consider it here. He is upheld by Jehovah that is sustained. This means that Jesus is really human. When he comes and he's really the servant, he's really human and weak. He takes on the likeness of weak flesh, everything the same as we, except for sin. This means he will need strength from on high. The only mediator that we could have is someone who is very God, in fact, but also in his human nature, strengthened by God in heaven. And children, you think your daddies are strong? God is almighty strong to uphold his servant, his servant, the Lord Jesus. And so he comes to bear our sin and guilt and the wrath of God for them. He has to be upheld in his human nature, or he would have perished everlastingly if he were some one not upheld by God. So he's upheld by him. And the third thing is about our text that points out here is he's loved of God. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. Jehovah delights in Jesus, his servant, in his very soul, with all his being. Now, of course, we understand that Jehovah, when he delights in anything, always delights in everything and anything with his soul, that is, with all of his being. Jehovah is not half-hearted in his delighting in certain things or certain ones, but here it's for emphasis. With his soul, there's a great passion with God, the God who never changes, the God who doesn't wax cold or hot in his passions, but a divine heat and fervency about his love for his son. You see, there's delight between Jehovah and his servant due to their unity, essential unity, a harmony of essence and attributes. They share also the same desires. They love the things that only the divine would love. They hate the things that the divine would hate, that is, the things of sin. And so there is delight in him as essentially one, but also as the son in the human nature, there is this delight of Jehovah in that son, for Christ can, or neither can, 
nor he will act contrary to Jehovah, but ever with his glory in view. So there's this delight in the one that Jehovah has appointed and whom he upholds. Besides that, we read also, I have put my spirit upon him so that he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. This is Jehovah giving to Messiah the Holy Spirit for his execution of the work. This gives the servant the right to execute judgment and proclaim it. This enables the servant to save. This was the prophecy of Isaiah 11 and verse 2, where we read there of the righteous branch, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And Isaiah 61, to name just one other passage that Jesus quotes at the beginning of his ministry in Nazareth, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty of the captives, and so on. So Jesus Christ is given the spirit. He is this loved one. He's this chosen one. He's this upheld, this one who's upheld by Jehovah God, and he has work to do. As all those who are truly servants of Jehovah have work to do and a purpose, if we would show the mutual delight of Jehovah and us, so especially the Messiah. He's the champion of, of the Christian work ethic. He's the one who comes, and it's not about himself or his play. He doesn't make sure that he has all of this time to himself as if it were kind of a side light and he could put the work of Jehovah aside. This characterizes Jesus as well as his suffering and that he's a worm and no man and so on. His work is something that consumes him. The servant has this work. Verse 1, he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Now that may seem like a strange work and may be hard to understand, but I want to point out to you that this is something repeated three or four times in our text. First, he shall bring forth justice or judgment to the Gentiles. Verse 3, he will bring forth justice for truth. Did you read that there? And then, verse 4, he will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Now, what does that mean? What is this talking about God and Jesus executing judgment and justice among the Gentiles and in the coastlands and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, first of all, I think we ought to remind ourselves that the text is speaking of Gentiles here, non-Jews. It speaks of them in particular in verse 1. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles, but then speaks of his establishing justice in the earth and the coastlands which will wait for his law. Those are the non-Jews who are nevertheless God's people. This is what God has in mind and Jesus has ever in mind. They're God's people, his elect from every nation. They're called the Isles, the nations beyond the Mediterranean Sea and beyond that too. This is in keeping with the prophecy of all of the Old Testament prophets that God has a plan not only for the Jews, but he has a plan for God's people in every nation, tribe, and tongue. So heaven shall be populated with these very ones for whom Jesus comes to execute judgment and justice. Prophecy points out that when God is through with the Jews, he will turn from them to the nations, and there will be this judgment to the Gentiles. What does it mean that Messiah brings forth judgment to the Gentiles? Well, it's not as we first might think, a reference to condemnation. We often use judgment that way, don't we? God's coming to judge, and we say he's coming to judge and condemn. 
That's true that we can use judgment in that sense, and that's a rather loose uh, sense of the term, however. But actually, judgment is here and often used in the broadest sense as right. And the idea is that specifically the right which the servant is going to bring forth is not condemnation. What he's going to do that's right is, in fact, salvation. In fact, this judgment to the Gentiles is used in a similar way to salvation in another prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 30 and verse 18. Therefore, the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. Therefore, he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. There's mercy and justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. That's not speaking of the Gentiles, but of the Jews. But the idea is, same, uh, is the same. There's a judgment which will be for the Gentiles, which is prophesied here and which will be for healing and salvation. This law, which will be for truth for the isles, is their salvation that will come to them through the work of the mediator. That this is clear, is clear from Matthew 12 and verse 20, the text we cited as the fulfillment of Jesus in, as the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 42. In Matthew 12, verse 20, a bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. And here's how the Holy Spirit interprets the prophecy of Isaiah 42. He a bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory. And in his name, Gentiles will trust. Now there you don't have something that's a contradiction between Old and New Testament, judgment there and victory in the New Testament. It's simply an interpretation of what the prophecy is meaning in the heart all along. The judgment, in other words, that Jesus will establish and proclaim is unto victory over sin and death. It is something that's brought forth even unto truth, even to its fulfillment as the fulfillment of God's own decree to save his own, not only Jew, but Gentile. Do you see, God's determination to save people is the right thing. It's right by God. It's just, it's merciful, it's in Jesus Christ. And when God decrees that, he sends the Son to perform that which is right, what he's decided all along, and this prophecy is the fulfillment of what God has decreed all along. And, and Christ brings it. He establishes it for the Gentiles. He sets it in the earth, verse 4. He will not fail or be discouraged till he has established justice, set it, that's the idea, put it so it's there like a rock in the earth. And we know this is fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus comes in the flesh. He suffers all his life on the, and then on the accursed cross in our place and takes, as it were, as one has said, the eternal truth that God has a people. And he carves that eternal truth into the cross. And there is the reality of what's right. God has said these my people, they shall be. And the cross says, amen to that. And this is Jesus establishing what God has decreed by satisfying the justice of God for those Gentiles, as well as for the Jews who are his people. He justifies us in his establishing justice on the earth so that we believe to us are imputed all the benefits of Christ's own atonement. He establishes it. This is the truth of Calvary. If only people would know what Christmas is all about. It's not just about a babe born to cry, though they have carols that say no crying he makes. 
But it's about a babe born to die and born to establish justice in the earth and the right to life of all those who are his and who are then given faith. Amazing. He proclaims that then. While he's on earth, what he did, and we read of this in Matthew 12 and verse 18, is that he proclaimed he proclaimed the truth. My beloved, Jesus is, who I put my spirit upon him, and he will declare or show or proclaim justice to the Gentiles. So not only does he establish it, he says something about it. Jesus does. While he was on the earth, he did that. He shouted loud and clear, I am the Messiah. And there's this righteousness that's going to be imputed to all who believe in me, this is Jehovah, our righteousness among you. And the church of Jesus Christ has this calling to proclaim this wonderful Messiah and his work. And as the church of Jesus Christ proclaims the truth as it is in Jesus, as we do this in our Advent sermons, as people hear this on the radio, on the internet, as they hear it in the pulpit and in the churches, they are those who are convicted by the truth, they must be, and they are called to believe, and if they do not, they are certainly pricked in their hearts that they are rejecting the truth as it is in Jesus. So the servant of the Lord, he goes forth today, this is not just something that occurred while he was on earth, and he proclaims the truth of his justice and mercy in himself. The second point I want to touch upon just now, and the third, I'll be rather brief about so that we don't rush this and we can consider this again in the next couple of weeks. But consider just this. For your meekness and for your own thankfulness this week to come, the manner and the might of Jesus the manner in which he comes is described in verse 2. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. That's the first thing. This bespeaks, as every commentator has agreed upon, the meekness and the quietness and the gentleness of our Savior. It's not like men of this world who cry out loudly and hawk their wares, who demonstrate publicly, who rile up the crowds, who tweet this, who tweet that, to get a following. He doesn't fall to what some have called maybe the fourth temptation. There were three temptations of Jesus in the wilderness, but one has said, the fourth temptation, if it were today, and he's speaking as a man, but it's intriguing. The fourth temptation for Jesus would have been the devil saying, go ahead and use the media. Use the internet, tweet this, tweet that, get on Facebook, Jesus, and you'll get a real following. Well, Jesus, he was, and I'm not going to go into that anymore, but... He was one who was altogether lovely in his unique method. And he came and he wasn't like an earthly king, born a babe and a king while he was a babe. And when he grew up, he wasn't crying out, follow me, boys, follow me, girls, follow me, mom and dad and whoever. He wasn't demonstrating publicly that his was the cause in the sense that we would and that we might, and that the disciples wanted him to do. They wanted him to work all the mighty miracles. Remember the crowd, the beginning of the Passion Week. Here he is, here he is, Messiah, Messiah. You can imagine what they were calling before they cried out that at the end of the week, crucify him. It's all because Jesus had a kingdom that was not of this world. It was not of the pride of man. It wasn't by carnal force or sheer or mere eloquence that he was trying to establish something. It wasn't by 
the vain threatenings that people use. And they say, if you don't follow me, this or that, the other thing. Though, of course, he, he would do this to the wicked. The point is, he was one whom to follow was not to follow because you thought his was going to be a successful cause compared to the other peddlers of the other evangel down the road or over there. His was not something that was ever without a cross, you see. And when he came, he would let the cross do the talking. And he would let his own words from heaven be the powerful words from heaven that they were. And he didn't have to add to his own words for effect. Whenever people didn't like the fact that Jesus wasn't pushing himself and crying out and hawking his gospel like others would have been, Jesus would say something like he said to Peter when he said, no, it's beneath you, Lord, to go to the cross. He'd say, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. No, Jesus wouldn't do that. It wasn't by carnal violence, by meekness and quietness. And simply this, and this is the key, because he was the servant of Jehovah. Now, he's God with us, to be sure. But he came to serve the one who's God whom he would serve in human nature. And all along, he, would, he had to remind the people, it's me, yes, in, indeed it's me, but it's me and human nature you're looking at here, and I don't want you to be stuck on that aspect of me only, because to see me is to see the Father, and you have to go to him. And when you pray, it's to the Father. And do you remember that even when he was accosted by the rich young ruler who thought he had all of it straight about religion. And he says, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What a mixed up guy. And Jesus stops him and says, don't call me good. There's one good. There's none good but me, but one, and that's God. Now you'd say, now why was Jesus doing this? He's God in the flesh, but you see, he was pointing this misguided person to God above. And that's exactly where Jesus would lead. And that's where a servant leads, to God above. In fact, when this is quoted of Jesus in Matthew, when Jesus is doing his miracles, and he healed them all, it's saying, yet he warned them not to make him known. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, the, uh, Isaiah the prophet saying, behold my servant whom I've chosen, and so on, he will not cry out, and all that. So, that's the idea here, of his not crying out, he's, he's meek, and he's pointing to God whom he serves. But that means, too, he comes mercifully. And you have that in verse 3, a bruised reed he will not break, smoking flax he will not quench. Now let's be clear here. This does not mean that Christ comes to everyone mercifully. No. For the Christ does come to bring forth judgment, to do what's right. Now for those in him, and for whom he dies, that judgment and what's right is to pay for their sins that they might be saved. And he comes to them in mercy. But for those not in him and for whom he does not die, the righteousness of God will not be compromised. We saw that this morning by somehow sparing people the judgment. 
No, the soul that sins shall die, Ezekiel says. And thus, when Jesus comes and people continue stubbornly to resist him, Jesus will come as a terror. And it's striking, I didn't know if you noticed that, but our text says he doesn't cry or raise his voice with regard to this bruised reed and smoking flax. But verse 19 says, or no, excuse me, verse 13 says, he shall cry out and, yes, shout aloud, he shall prevail against his enemies. So with the one people, you have him not crying out. With the other, his enemies, he cries out. What's well, indeed the case. The Jesus, meek and mild, is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the Son of God, whom God gives to this world, and whom he gives to this world, who is the king who breaks the wicked with a rod of iron. You have Psalm 2, verse 9, that says, He dashes in pieces like a potter's vessel all those who raise their fists against him. The fact is, to some he comes in mercy and pity, and I want to leave you with this. It's to bruise reeds and smoking flax. It's a striking figurative way of describing a certain people who are bruised reeds and smoking flax. And a reed is the weakest of plants. And it blows in the wind and it breaks under ice and under wind. And very, very weak. It's not only a reed, it's a bruised reed. Prone to break at the slightest of winds and storms. The smoking flax... Flax was one of the grains that was used for oil, but also it was used to make uh, th uh, threads and, and things for clothing. As well, it was joined together with flax and woven together to be a kind of wick in an oil lamp. And so that you put oil on the flax and you lit it and it would burn. The smoking flax means it's just about to go out. It's not a burning flax. It's smoking flax, and it's just about to go out if not for the help of Messiah. And it's a reference to people. And it's a reference, dear ones, to you and to me. And I believe it's a reference to us always. Sometimes we feel like it more than others, but it's a reference to us always who have just a small beginning of the new obedience and who have a terrible tendency to sin. And who are exposed to all of the problems of this world. Ever wonder why God leaves us in this world? Well, it's so we might understand. We're just like the smoking flax and the bruised reeds. We're just so prone to be out. And there's hardly anything there in our lives, it seems. And again, more, sometimes we're more sensitive to this than at others. And churches, churches that are true and faithful, that they feel the heat of the world and the pressures to conform. And families can feel that way as well. And, and we eke out a living and we wonder, what's it all for? And it seems so vain and, and we don't succeed as we ought. And this is the kind of people Jesus comes to as Messiah. And he says... I'm here not to break you. I'm here not to put you out. I'm here because you're mine. I'm here because I love you and I want to show you that. I'm the savior of the smoking flax. I'm the savior of the bruised reed. I'm that kind of a savior that's not here to call the righteous or the great or the mighty but to call sinners to repentance. And I'm calling his people to trust in me. And I'm calling them to be whole me. So that if nothing else is significant in their life, and they go through life and they live and they die, and they're, they're 94 when they die, or they're nine seconds old when they die, the significance about them would be they were mine. 
and they trusted in me, and I loved them, and they knew that. That's what Christmas is all about. The servant of Jehovah come for people like you and like me. Behold that. Amen. Lord God in heaven, we pray with the gratitude you don't put us out. You don't cast us aside. You don't break us. What a wonderful God you are to send your Son in the depths of your love and the way of your righteousness. Who can know? Who can know? Oh, God bless us. Be mindful of our human frailty, O oh God, in whom we trust. Be mindful of your own glory, Father. We know you cannot deny yourself. You'll be with us to the end. You've sent your Son. May we all know that he who sent his Son to die for us, who spared him not, will surely with him also freely give us all things and never separate us from your love. Bless this dear congregation, beloved of you, and which shall be kept to the end of the age. Amen.